<laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm very honored to be a uh, part of this. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, hold on one second. Why don't we just take a look at this. Uh, there we go. That looks a little better. View. So Zen in the City, this idea of digital interventions that come into uh, our urban architecture. There is one thing that I just want to uh, say to tie into the early morning speeches, this idea of science uh, meeting with arts. And uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about quite a bit is in a world where we're trying to have so many toolkits, so many templates, so many easy to replicate models, what is the role of the unexpected? And I think one of the things that's quite important is we have this expression that exception makes the rule. And very often, this is where we ought to be thinking about um, our relationship with the artists. How to Work Better is a retrospective of the artists Peter Fishley and David Weiss at the Guggenheim. And as part of the exhibition, Times Square is showing Busey, or Kitty, as part of the Midnight Moment program. And it's a little bit of a welcome back. It was originally shown in 2001 when Creative Time did the 59th minute. And this year we've got it not just on one screen, but actually we have a cat surrounding us for five blocks on 54 screens, silently lapping its milk, its daily activity, looking down on us, perhaps pondering, perhaps not, and really allowing us to look at how the ordinary can become a spectacle and how a spectacle becomes quite ordinary. from in my perspective. Um, I work across the ideas of sustainability, so I'm thinking about long-term infrastructure, I'm thinking about strategy, I think about master planning, I think about impermanence. So I think about how architecture sometimes has temporary interventions and how we realize that placing something we don't expect can sometimes rejuvenate how we deal with public space. And what I'm going to focus on right now is this concept of the ephemeral, and really how media and performance helps translate and transform our relationship to our public space. This can be done through a series of ways, and this is the work that I do as a curator investigates this. So it might be creating these performative moments for people to uh, think about either an obscure space or a destination space. I look at projection. These were images that were done before everybody was actually mapping <laughs> architecture. So very simple things like interventions on buildings or understanding how uh, making a heritage icon come to life or thinking about how we create three-dimensional projection. Screens, how do we take advantage of the existing screens, whether they are interior, something that we think we're used to seeing, or whether there is something outdoors. In these two cases, uh, on the top right, was the idea of the simulcast of the what is often considered a very exclusionary art form of opera being presented in Times Square, the center of popular culture. Or on the bottom, I worked with an artist named Jay Scheib, and we created the first real-time feature film that was taking content from a theater production that was happening simultaneously, being live edited and projected into a movie theater. And really it's important that we think that the urban screens, you know, they're part and of our daily life now, and we need to start thinking about them as real estate. So you see them on your average commute, whether you're coming in by plane, train, driving by car, or walking. They're now stuck on to architecture, they're added into our spaces. They start to become part of the architecture, where the screens are actually developed as a part of design into buildings. 
And now we're actually looking at it as the architecture itself. How it is conceived of that this actually changes our type of environment. So this concept has already been addressed, but just to, to quote one of the uh, researchers who runs a program at the University of Liverpool and works specifically in this area, we must ask ourselves a larger question of how these new forms of media and their cinescapes they create can benefit both the individuals and society at large. So I'm going to talk to you about what this Midnight Moment program is, and is it actually this kind of, to steal John Stewart's phrase, a moment of zen. Times Square is a space that is incredibly vibrant, I think we can say. <laughs> it's got over 265 electronic billboards, and it has a series of other illuminated billboards. It now has had the public space um, redesigned so that Broadway now has become pedestrianized and it's become a public plaza. It is a place in which the artist Luc Dubois, who is also a musician and engineer, discovered when he was in residence that over 17,000 images a day are uploaded to just Instagram that are hashtag Times Square. It has uh, over 1.8 million followers across the social media platforms. It really fluctuates between being the number one, two, and three spaces checked into. It has over 300,000 people per day. The, the sign holders estimate that there are about 1.5 million impressions made a day, over 50 million annual visitors. So understanding what the contemporary context is, it's also taking a look at what this historic identity is. And Times Square has always been the center of understanding what's going to be the advancement in the modern age. It was called the Great White Way. This idea of screens and illuminated signage in Times Square actually began at about 1894. At the time that the subway station was opened in Times Square, there were over 200,000 visitors a day. So this concept of it being crowded, used, is not new whatsoever. It then, in the 70s, became, well, the site of where great uh, pornographic advancements were made, I guess we could say, <laughs> and also an innovation in the sort of B-rated movies, um, such as kung fu films and such. So I took the position of the director of public art in Times Square uh, back in 2012. And um, the only way that I was interested in taking it is how to actually access it as a platform of experimentation. That usually there was this concept at that time that public art had to be something that was the safest, the most reliable, the most family friendly, and that there was a different platform of artists who performed those. But really what we looked to was to form this way that we were actually collaborating with contemporary artists. We were really thinking about experimenting and engaging with this place. We pulled together basically five sort of core values, and this helped us to determine the kind of work that we wanted to do. Everything went through this filter. So rather than starting with that question about what is it that I cannot do, we focused it on what we could do. And then the program we really developed across the potential resources or platforms that we had. So in addition to Midnight Moments, there were also the plazas and thinking about live performance or installations that would engage in the space but also this idea of hidden assets, how we would go off the beaten path or how we would explore the virtual realm. So Midnight Moment is, is still the largest and longest running uh, digital exhibition that is happening. It has been running every single night since May of 2012, and every month there is a new artist that is curated. We formed this partnership in, in 2012, and we decided that you know, since people came to Times Square for the countdown to midnight, that we realized this was our magic witching hour, and how could we have this sort of experience happen on a regular basis. What you probably don't know is that every single screen is individually owned, individually operated. In order to deliver this program, there are 143 individuals who are involved. And this means all of their approval processes and a very complex set of technical specifications that need to be met for each of these screens. This is an enormous background of infrastructure to run a seemingly simple moment of Zen. We started with Robert Wilson, um, an artist who was running his center prior to this role, and he had been working on a series of video portraits. 
And so the best way for me to be able to communicate without these sort of fine arts, art historical language, to the advertisers who I needed to win over is that basically we would do a series of um, portraits of celebrities and animals in high definition. One thing that we learned is that while this was beautiful and people who knew the work could identify it, they couldn't really identify a central work through the chaos that was happening. Very soon after, we then worked with Jean Pochot, who had done a piece originally on film that was set in um, a canyon. And the way that he had shot it was such that he was in a car going by. And we realized that we could manipulate this experience of something traveling across the screens, even though it wasn't, by the motion of the actual film, and also the light that it created on the ground. We uh, worked with Yoko Ono to create, uh, to show her work, Imagine Peace. And we did it on the night that the world was supposed to end. We gathered over a thousand uh, visitors to come together and sing Imagine together so that we could prevent the end of the world. This very simple three minute action gathered international press of over 500 million press impressions and over 53 countries became interested. And it was a way to pique the interest of how a very simple but poignant action can get uh, people's attention and thinking. We also worked with artists who are no longer alive. Jack Goldstein's work, this is the first time that the estate ever allowed a remastering of one of his works. We worked with the Warhol Museum to look through over the 465 screen tests of Andy Warhol, took those up in celebration. And then some of the smaller pieces that had been done in Times Square previously on one screen, we recreated as an extension of a museum's uh, exhibition. So Alfredo Jarre's uh, logo for America was recreated then, and instead of being on one screen, it was across 50 to 60 screens, and this marked an important moment in, in a piece at the Guggenheim Museum. As you saw, we also uh, included the work of Fishman Weiss, you see. I worked with artists to actually create new works. So this is by Chris Doyle, and what he did is he created a natural canyon back in Times Square, and research the geology and, and also the, the botany and the wildlife that would have been in Times Square had it stayed a, a natural environment. We worked with Charles Atlas, and uh, the artist that was known at the time as Anthony, to present You Are My Sister. This may seem like it's a really simple piece, but the thing that was so poignant about this is that we did it in the month of December leading up to New Year's. And it was a series of portraits of women. But all but one of the women who were the subjects actually began their life as a woman. So the idea of turning over the most expensive real estate in the world to a celebration of transgender women meant that it had a big impact across many communities that didn't have necessarily a contemporary relationship to Times Square. We worked with uh, British artists such as Tracy Emin, this is actually the first time that she created a public work. Isaac Julian had just created Playtime and he did a special edition for us in Times Square at the same time that he was showing at MoMA. We worked with the Brazilian twin brothers to create their first animation. And the idea for them was that instead of looking at the screens, the content or the uh, individuals within the screens were actually looking at you the audience. With the artist Daniel Kaniger, we actually set up a green screen and filmed people crawling across the screen screen that within another month was transferred into this idea of these bodies actually crawling the screens of Times Square. So it was a way in which we exposed the actual process and involvement of the audience back into being the subject matter. We worked with Ryoji Akeda. And uh, one night, we actually set up the silent disco headphones, and we were allowed to play one of his huge, immersive concerts in cooperation with this. 
And then I'm going to show you just this video because Marco Rambia really describes some of the advantage of what it's like to use a stop. Now, one minute and count. The Apollo 18, which is a site-specific video installation I made in collaboration with NASA, and it was conceived specifically for the show in Times Square. Apollo 18 is a mission that NASA never launched in the 70s. I wanted to see what it would be to stage a fictitious mission and call it Apollo 18 and to use Times Square as a virtual launch site and bringing computer-generated imagery, archive material from NASA, which is combined into this very abstract interpretation of what the mission could be and a very contemporary interpretation of what this mission would look like today and bringing it back into a communal viewing environment much the same way people saw the first original lunar landing when people were huddled around televisions or in public spaces so the work was conceived in a very specific way using all the screen clusters and the geography of Times Square to create the sense that you are really witnessing a launch as people Instagram and share imagery of this launch, although this is a complete fiction, it crosses over into the realm of public consciousness and crosses over into the realm of something that may or may not have really happened or, or, or will happen. Sentimental about things. 
And it's the techniques that she uses, she's going to talk about later, so I'm not going to take that over and I might ask her a couple of questions now. But um, that became very interesting as far as the materiality the, um, and the play throughout the space. Oops, and my video has disappeared. I'm so sorry, I was going to play you a video of your work <laughs> on the screen so that you could actually witness it. Um, I can show that they did. You'll have to stay for later when it, when it will be shown. Um, but this idea of creating these breaths, or originally one of the titles I was thinking about for this, this program was Commercial Break. Um, it's important that there's a contrast to what's going on around us on these screens and we allow ourselves to be pulled out and to have moments in which we do not necessarily need to act directly, buy something directly, change our lives directly, communicate directly. And so I just want to leave you with this quote from Rebecca Solnit. A city always contains more than any inhabitant can know. And a great city always makes the unknown and the possible spurs to the imagination. So I feel that it's very, very critical that we look at all of these screens, all of these services, and we understand that they're not just elusive. These are part of our architecture. This is part of what our city is, and they have a relationship with us. And it's important that we all took a look, take a look at these resources and think about how we can access them, take them back, and turn them over to the artists that allow us, probably best, to help spur um, what we think is known and what we can find in our imagination. Thank you. Thank you. Most unusual about doing the work there. Uh, uh, it, it, well, I, 
It means a uh, to more simple again. Because you know, uh, for us, the thing is, uh, you know, a joke is like a chance operation. Mm. Once a time, you know, life is one, one time. And this is the most important. Why living in here and talking to each other? You know, uh, this is kind of my philosophy like this. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So, uh, do you have any questions? Please. Yes. Um, given the range of what you can do and the possibilities, how do you begin to set out deciding how to make choices and how to link things mm -hmm. together in sequences and how to make some kind of coherence out of it all? Do you mean um, artistically or in the infrastructure of, of accessing these spaces? I can't see you can really separate the two. <laughs> um, yeah. The, the easy answer is that it's not easy and there's not one straightforward way. Um, but, you know, as we heard earlier this morning, communication, you know, particularly from our ambassador, we're all slightly ambassadors. Um, we need to be able to ask questions. We need to listen. We need to be respectful. And very often what I do is um, just first ask for the ideal, listen to what happens as a result. And as a result of that, I spend a lot of time matching up objectives. For example, I'm, I'm doing some work um, with the Business Improvement District in London Bridge. And um, I was talking to a very small cultural institution, the old operating theater, and said, if you could have anything, what would you want? And they said, oh, well, presence in London Bridge Station, but I mean, that's crazy, we'll never get it, et cetera. Later that day, I was talking to some people in Network Rail. And what they said is, God, you know, we would just love it. We'd left this one space. We'd love it if cultural institutions had any desire to do any exhibition in our space. Very often people want the same thing. They either don't know to ask, or they don't necessarily ask in a way that is respectful and curious and listening themselves. And then it's really trying to, to hit the opportunity together. Um, it's very popular right now to quote, use artists as a tool. We have lots of ideas about where artists can fit in, and sometimes we don't pay attention to actually what artists are doing and how they create. And so the important thing is to respect everybody. What do they want to achieve? And, and, and also to take a look at what artists already are doing, where they already are pushing things, and finding a natural platform and space for them to be able to present, as opposed to constantly having them forced into doing something outside of their practice. Um, so I like to just take advantage of every possible introduction opportunity that I have to start planting concepts or ideas or asking questions into people's minds. And it's really just a human interaction of finding those moments where you can link people up. And um, you know, I'm not a good capitalist, despite being American. So I probably lose a lot of money. I, I connect people all the time, even if I'm not making money off of it. Um, and I think but you know, this idea of a shared economy is important on many levels. And if all of us realize that we have access to networks that you might take for granted, but when you're talking to people and you suggest the possible pairing, it's amazing how quickly major things can happen. Okay. Thank you very much. Very good Okay, uh, see you later.